these winds that are blowing makes us think, wait a minute, I heard a message in 1986. There have been many. Your dad has been writing prolific columns in the newspaper trying to wake the people up. They read, they understand, they try, and then their movement is crushed or whatnot. Not today. The winds are going to blow so hard as the foot bone connected to the ankle bone, connected mm -hmm. to the leg bone, the hip bone, the back bone. We're going to come together because that's the only way we can solve our problem. And about the word disappointment, I've been doing this for 50 57 years. I'll be 80 years old, God willing, in the next two months. And the old saying, I ain't no ways tired. Why? Because I know that even though there's a tendency to be disappointed, I know we're going to respond. It, you may not respond when we would like you to respond, but you will respond because the only other answer is total destruction. And I don't think we want to be totally destroyed. I don't think we want to see Belize suffer more and more. I think we want to see Belize rise. And I also think we want to see the region rise, not only the Central American region, but the Caribbean region. And the only way we can rise is to come together in unity and share our knowledge, pool our resources, and we'll change our reality. Oftentimes we look at the experiences of an individual who has led uh, an amount of people. And like Moe's, I too had not seen that video, audio, anything of your visit in 1986 to Belize. At that time I would have been 12 years old and I wasn't even aware that you were here. But after seeing that video, I think it prepared me for events that happened in our country that you may not be aware of. Recently we had a call for land demonstration, a call for land reform, and a good bulk of your speech on that day spoke about land and Belizeans understanding the value of land and respecting what it can do for us and, and how we can move forward and become really independent because being independent is not just saying a word it's it's by your actions and we had some disappointments um, with that land demonstration that happened recently the amount of people that came out the people that responded to the message but then i look at your a part of your resume long a lot of accomplishments achievements one of which you were able to get 130 moss back on track in America after the Nation of Islam was disbanded. And I thought to myself, what a task it must have been. I find that when somebody accomplishes so much, it is only fitting that they share a little bit of that journey um, with those who are freedom fighters, who are trying to accomplish the like in their society. It may not be reopening mosques. It may not be um, uniting a million people, but in their own right, in their own country, it's just as significant. Um, so I would really be honored if you would share with us just a bit of that experience. Well, coming up in a West Indian home, no father, but a very strong black mother my father was a follower of the Right Honorable Marcus Garvey. My mother was on the fringe of the movement. I have no recollection of my father, but I thank God for him because it is his seed that germinated the egg in the womb of my mother and she brought me forth and she nurtured me to love black people. 
my love for our people has been so strong all my life that when I was a little boy in church, in the Sunday school they would talk to me about how Moses delivered the children of Israel and they would talk about these great ones that God sent to suffering people. And I would ask my Sunday school teacher, if God did all of this for others and we are suffering a tremendous persecution and oppression in America, why wouldn't God send someone to us? And my teacher had no answer for that. And so I started looking. I had an uncle from St. Kitts that lived in New York. And on the mantelpiece in my home, my mother being a British subject, she had King George and Queen Elizabeth on the mantelpiece. And there was a picture of Jesus, the Savior, and he was white. Well, I had no problem with that. But when I went to my uncle's home, I saw no white people at all on his mantelpiece. So I looked up, there was a black man on the wall. I said, who is that man? He said, that's a man that came to unite our people. Well, I was 11 years old, so I stood on a chair to look up in this man's face and I said, where is he that I might go and see him? He said, uh, unfortunately, he's dead. And the tears fell from my eyes, and that was a picture of Marcus Garvey. I say that to say this. If you studied your father, and I'm sure you have, and you study great leaders that come to help us. They all suffer some form of privation, disappointment, prison, and Dr. King assassinated, Malcolm X assassinated. But what is the driving force that keeps Mr. Hyde writing? What is the driving force that keeps you doing what you do on this radio station day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year? Something that's in the breast of love for God love for your people, love for truth. And there's a scripture that says, perfect love casteth out fear. Most of the people that suffer, they have no courage to stand up for something bigger than themselves. With me, Sister Sharon, my love for black people and particularly my love for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the great work that he did would not allow me to allow his name to be written out of history because all his works were like buried. So I decided to try and rebuild his work even though I could have been killed. My family could have been killed. And even today, there are those who hate the message that will lift black people. So your life is always hanging in the balance. But those who fight for a cause bigger than themselves, their life is not a vain existence so they never die 
when you live beyond yourself you live in that which goes on after you cease to be and so that is why my work god has blessed it with a degree of success but one day i was with my teacher and a young man was sitting at the table and he talked about uh, a few people that had accepted the faith and elijah muhammad did this he said uh, i didn't send you to a mosque i sent you to a city have you conquered the city he said no have you conquered the state man said no he said well honor does not come until the job is done so i take all the steps people honor me with this honor me with that i thank them but the job is not done so i'm finite if i live a little longer by god's grace i'll continue to work but now i'm preparing young men young women strong young men and women to carry the work on i already see that we're going to win belize is going to win i know it the oppressive power that keeps belize down keeps us arguing and fighting with each other keeps africa down they're on their way out i know it so when i preach the end of this that is called white supremacy and black inferiority that's going to end and it ends those of us who've been fighting to see our people rise that opposition that is formidable it will be gone and the path for our success will be more bright more easy whatever minister when you when you speak uh, and you and you and you say to people this system is not going to last forever it's going to come down this this is not this is not indefinite and as you said you prophesy to the fact that you see victory ahead there are times when somebody interprets that and says well that means that i can just sit down and wait to see that because the honorable minister says it's going to it's going to come down we are going to win so we just going to wait for victory day that person will never see the victory <laughs> <laughs> because i'm not saying that we're going to win so everybody can sit down and say well we're going to win <laughs> no no you know jesus put it like this or they have a song in the church must jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free no there's a cross for you and there's <laughs> a cross for me so i'm on my cross i'm working you got to get up and take yours because it's going to be all of us working together toward the victory that we'll see the victory i i have we had uh, brother nuri mohammed with us on thursday it would have been but the news and i i asked because i, I must say it, it 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 was quite a profound moment watching the video from 1986 and that's why we we visited and i looked at the standing room audience only audience that was there on the birds aisle and i can't imagine it's going to be any less crowded this time around so i know that or people love your message and i know they will be there to get the message again but my generation has to look at those people and say well there's a responsibility when you hear a message to know that the action is not in attending the event that gave you the message it is not the action the action follows the message is it is it is it cultural is it is it is it a flaw where we 
we, we get this euphoric feeling about the message. We get mesmerized, but don't get down and get dirty afterwards. Because the message says get dirty. But we just get a high of the message. As long as there are people like you, as long as there are people like your dad, as long as there are people like Nuri Muhammad, you can't sleep on a good message. Others wait for somebody else to make a way for them. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to us, blessed is the man or woman who forges the way for others. So the, in every audience, there'll be those that do this. Right on, brother. Great message. But there's others say, man, I'm getting up from here and I'm going to work. And that's where leadership is demonstrated. You know, dear brother, our young people are the finest generation that we have ever produced. They may not look like it now. They're born warriors. They're tired of their elders who say the good word but don't do the good work. In America, after, you know, segregation gave us benefit because we had to take our money, spend it with our own. So we had banks, we had insurance companies, we had bus companies, we had hotels and motels and restaurants and farms and small factories. But the moment the enemy saw, look at the money that we are missing because they're spending that money among themselves and building institutions. So then came integration. And because we could be approved by our former slave masters and their children, and it looked like all of a sudden our enemies had become our friends, we went to spend our money in their hotels, in their motels, in their restaurants, and all of a sudden, our economy began to die. So here we are in America right now with an annual income this year, they say, of $1.1 trillion. That would make us the seventh to the ninth largest economy in the world. Other nations have schools, factories, farms, hospitals, what do we have? Nothing. So somehow now the old generation has dropped the ball. If I may say, in the, in the Quran and in the Bible, Moses was telling the people, look, God is going to give you a land. But there were some giants in the land. So the elders told Moses, hey, well, look, Moses, they're giants, and I ain't going in that land until you and your God clean those giants out. So God told Moses, let them wander in the wilderness until they die out, and I will take their children, and they will inhabit the promised land. I'm saying that, Brother Mose, to say this. This generation of young people uh, is the generation of promise. And because the enemies know that, in every Caribbean island and in all of the nations, you find it's the youth that are the revolutionaries. In Tahrir Square, in in Cairo, Egypt. Look in the faces of the people. It's the young. In Bahrain, it's the young. In Syria, it's the young. In Libya, it's the young. In Belize, it's the young. So how do you engage the young so they destroy each other? 
so that there will never be a future where Belize will come to real 